by now all of you are aware most of the people who attended the uh, attending the webinar are aware that we have monthly webinars like this uh, where we are bringing up uh, bringing people eminent personalities from uh, medical and other fraternities actually to kind of uh, give uh, their experience and uh, kind of uh, knowledge share the knowledge with the public so that we can start adapting a healthy lifestyle one by one and uh, this is our fifth webinar this time we have dr kaushik reddy uh, he is not just a, a doctor a cardiologist is a mentor for me personally uh, because uh, 2000 um, 17 or something you know i've been introduced to kaushik and the group and uh, you know from there i learned a lot you know like uh, the overall aspect of lifestyle uh, rather if, uh, before that it was more to do with the diet and other things <laughs> i've been introduced to all the aspect of lifestyle and actually dr angela angela his wife is the one who also inspired me to take up the exam she insisted that you write this time you know like it was highly stressful for me to write but uh, you know i decided to go ahead with them you know that's how i wrote the exam and uh, whenever i see dr kaushik reddy with the dip ablm i always uh, felt that i want to take it one day <laughs> okay so that way also they have inspired me a lot so dr kaushik reddy is director of intern Inter interventional cardiology at james a halley veterans hospital in tamba florida they also run a uh, non profit there uh, he actually graduated from gandhi medical college hyderabad and completed his residency at jamaica hospital medical center um and he's been practicing cardiology over the last uh, 15 years or so after being involved with cardiovascular care and advanced to cardiac interventions for years with the veterans administration he established a cardiology based lifestyle clinic called cardiology heal heal means heal healthy eating and living in addition dr reddy integrated lifestyle medicine and whole food plant based nutrition into the core curriculum of the cardiology fellowship at tamba <clears throat> recently he founded the plant based nutrition movement community based non profit organization that's working to take the power of plant based nutrition and lifestyle movement to the grassroots level dr reddy is currently aclm board treasurer as well as founder and co chair of aclm armed forces or veteran self administration uh, interest group uh doc we are all excited to hear from you actually basically you know like some of the stories which uh, you uh, post on facebook i always share in our group we do have multiple groups called uh, you know hop health optimization group diabetic reversal group cardiac uh, you know prevention group and you can serve prevent i think christy is one of the major active <laughs> person there so i sometimes i share share screenshots today is one also the 100 year olds uh, have shared actually so they are all actually knowing partly <laughs> a lot about you so uh, uh, now we can start off all right now thank you uh, regina for this kind words of introduction and uh, as you've heard yeah, i am i'm an interventional cardiologist i live in tampa uh, florida in usa and um, so been here almost 25 26 years in the us and originally from hyderabad went to school and all of that there so again once uh, thank you uh, for asking me to do this presentation and we're going to talk about preventive strategies and and the current situation of cardiovascular health as it is mostly in india and what we can do um to uh to change that All right so it's okay so this presentation is mostly for educational purposes i don't practice medicine in india uh, and this is not a professional or a medical advice nor are we forming a patient doctor relationship uh that's uh, that's with your local doctors in india and uh before you you know as you receive this information before you make any personal changes please consult uh with your local physician extremely important and i have no financial disclosures i have no conflict of interest i you know i work for the us va system so for all practical purposes from a financial disclosure point of view i am a public servant and uh the reason i do this you know when a lot of friends and family ask in india you know it's just a labor of love and the only you know interest that i have in addition to what i do for a living is uh, i run a non profit organization here in tampa called pblm.org we'll talk about it towards the end and uh one of the first question is you know you know i'm an interventional cardiologist right hey the likes of me usually don't talk about prevention 
the likes of me don't spend Saturday afternoon uh, giving presentations across the world uh, to prevent disease. So in effect, what I'm trying to do uh, or what my message entails is uh, the message of how to make someone like myself go jobless, right? So that's exactly what I'm doing. So, so what am I doing and why am I doing? So my story, if you wanna look it up as to how did I transition from, I, I'm still an interventional cardiologist. I do a lot of procedures almost on a daily basis, but how did I transition to doing that in the silo of a deep, dark uh, lead shielded cardiac cath lab to meeting patients, friends, families, and now general Why am I doing this? And my story as a narrative, I wrote it as an essay a couple of years ago in the American College of Lifestyle Medicine's online publication. Uh, it's open access. You just Google, I have a carrot and a stent. You pick uh, and you put my name next to it. You should be able to read you know, as to my own personal and professional transition as to how I got there. And yes, I am one of those crazy people who were the hospital with that very phrase right underneath my name. So uh, not really for a stent, uh, but I use that line as a metaphor to talk about how much of this disease is preventable and also as a conversation starter for my patients, friends, and family members. So one, uh, a couple of questions I wanna start with is that why are we all here? You know, it's Saturday evening in India and it's, uh, you probably are, you know, wondering, you know, why am I not watching a movie or celebrating some event with family or, you know, why am I watching this, <laughs> some cardiologist that I never met from across the world? And same thing for me, you know, why are we all here? So at the end of the day, yes, some of us are physicians, some of us are not, but we are all human. Right. So at the end of the day, even, you know, believe it or not, across the world, the leading cause of death amongst cardiologists is heart disease. Right. Shocking. But, but that tells us the human side of who we are, uh, our strengths and our limitations. But the core of the message is that we all want to be healthy because we are just as human, uh, even as physicians. Right. So the main objective of this lesson or this discussion, I want to call it, is that I would like for this PowerPoint to somehow transition into a personal commitment, both for physicians and non-physicians, and also a, a professional commitment. And if you perceive this discussion as a monotonous one-way lecture, I would like for this lecture to somehow transition into a better lifestyle. So that's my main objective. If I if I succeed, you know, let's, you know, I'm, I would be very happy about it. If it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a PowerPoint that I put together, but unless it changes into your personal habits and into your pantry, it is pointless. So that's my goal. And I hope I will meet my own and your expectations today. So the question now is that what does health actually mean to us? A lot of times we don't take time to sit down for a minute and think about it. But when you think about it, believe it or not, there is actually a, a, an agreed upon definition put forth by the World Health Organization almost over a generation ago. So health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So a lot of us may be disease-free or are free of a medical condition. Does that necessarily make us healthy if we are compromising other components of you know, who we are as humans? So health, believe it or not, is an inside job. And the, for discussions like this, you know, the English word healthy can be broken apart into heal thyself, meaning that majority of staying healthy is actually an inside job, it's in our hands. And you can technically, literally take that word into you know, all of our ancestral roots, uh, is swast, you know, Sanskrit or Hindi word for health is literally, you don't even have to break it apart, a conjugation of self consciousness. That's what the word comes from. Swast is nothing but a conjugation in Sanskrit of two separate words, which mean inner consciousness. So this is what I mean by health is an inside job. So at this point, I would like to bring about a, a concept and with a clear distinction is the concept of maintaining health versus managing disease. Most of us physicians, including you know, people like Regina and other physicians in the group, uh, no matter what, what we practice, what we are trained to do and what we do for the most part is we maintain disease. 
we, we manage disease. We rarely get involved in maintaining health. And that, that was one of my personal transition points because in the American education system, if you were to become an interventional cardiologist, it is 17 years of uninterrupted training after high school. So you spend those 17 years just training and you graduate and you put you know, 10, 15, 20 years of experience behind you. And one day you wake up from self-induced coma and you find out that all that you're doing is putting band-aids on leaking dams. And you find out that all that you're doing is managing disease and you're not maintaining health. So that was a moment of rude awakening for me a few years ago. And that's what transitioned for me to make a humble plea to as many people as I potentially could to, to stop this. And uh, speaking of health being a responsibility in 1975, uh, Chicago Tribune said this about the American society, that the idea of preventive medicine is faintly un-American. It means first recognizing that the enemy is us. What saddens me when I read this every single time when I do this type of presentations is that this statement is now not only more applicable to American society, it is applicable to pretty much the rest of the world, except for very few small pockets of healthy societies. Is that most of the disease, current disease burden is due to lack of personal responsibility or personal awareness. So the question that, you know, if I were to put each one of you on the spot and ask you, hey, let's take a minute and I want all of you to answer this question for me, which we are not gonna to do today because of the interest of time, but I do this with my patients every Friday when I do the lifestyle medicine discussions, is why do you wanna be healthy? And no matter how detailed and how descriptive and how passionate your answers are, your, all of your answers will fall into two broad categories. We want to be healthy because we want to maintain a good quality of life, right? And two, we want to maintain we want to maintain that quality of life for as long as possible, right? So now, although I'm showing these two entities in two separate boxes, they are inseparable. They are like two sides of a coin. And, and, and as a circle, and you know, for those of us, no matter you know, what religion, what language we speak, from a spiritual or from, a, you know, from, a, the, from the deep roots point of view, life being a circle for those of us with Indian ancestry uh, is not a foreign concept. Right? But what I would like to do is take you through a journey from life actually being a circle in the previous slide. I wanna take you through a journey and convince you the way how I see life as a box. So what we're gonna do here, take you through the journey of a uh, hundred years uh, using those two parameters that we wanna be healthy because we wanna have a good quality of life and we want a good quantity of life in terms of longevity. So we're gonna take those two and draw ourselves a graph. So let's go back a hundred years ago. In 1920, the average person in India died at a age of 29. That was the average life expectancy in 1929. 1920 in India was 29 years. During those short 29 years, the quality of life dwindled down very rapidly because people did not have access to anything that we take for granted. Simple things like clean running water, simple things like having access to universal vaccination, antibiotics, being able to go see a primary care doctor, access to clean food, right? And all of this were not available and not to mention other major social issues. So because of those reasons, those people lived very short lives and they died miserably for lack of better words. Now you fast forward to 2020 or 2021 and life expectancy now is 65. So it, it, it doubled, right? And nowhere in recorded human history, this has happened, that average life expectancies are doubling. And this is not just true for India. This is actually true for the richest of the rich countries and the poorest of the poor countries on the planet, that in the past 100 to 150 years. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, our life's curve today is And what's happening is that very early on, people are gaining weight. And this is true even in India now. 
majority of urban society, if you look at children, you know, and we're going to talk about that as we go into the details of the presentation. Before you know, almost every Indian household before they're between 40 and 45, they're popping blood pressure medications. And then diabetes, India, I don't need to tell you guys as to how bad the diabetes situation is in India. And as a consequence of that, extremely, India is now officially per capita, the world's capital of male erectile sexual dysfunction. And, and which as a surrogate and a precursor for cardiovascular disease. And then the kidney disease is on the rise. And then heart, you know, hemodialysis, patients go on dialysis and then a cancer or two. But sadly, yes, while we are living longer, we are also dying longer. Right. What I argue, you know, what people like myself, Dr. You know, Regina, or, or in the people who live in the space of healthy living or lifestyle medicine, what we argue is that 90% of the things that killed us for eons since humans evolved on this planet was infection and famine. Most people are no longer dying due to those things. Even in, in the era of COVID, most people are not dying due to infection and, and, and famine. So is it unreasonable to ask ourselves to live a life where we take complete control of things that we are actually in control of and live a life that looks like this, where at any given time you drop the line down that the life should look like a box, right? So the concept here is live long and die short. So now if you draw our life's curve or life's graph against quality of life and quantity of life, it should look like a box because no matter how hard we try, one day we're all gonna end up in a box. So social anthropologists call this concept the rectangularization of life. Is that our life's graph when plotted against quality and longevity, no matter what age we die at, should look like a box. So that's kind of my brief introductory words as to the kind of as to what is the philosophy behind wanting to do all of this and share this message. But in terms of, you know, this, this Regina had asked me to specifically talk about cardiovascular disease and uh, cardiovascular prevention in India. So the current status, you know, at the turn of the century, cardiovascular disease is now the leading cause of mortality in India. The number one killer in India is no longer infectious diseases. It are preventable, non-communicable diseases. An Indian currently is being diagnosed and dying of heart disease 10 years earlier compared to the rest of the human population. And look at the deaths due to heart disease before 70, right? Deaths before age 70 due to cardiovascular disease is about 23% in the Western world and it's 52% in India. And for every case, when you get diagnosed, an Indian tends to have higher chances of dying. Right? And this is a, there's been a huge epidemiological shift, right? In the past, you know, 40, 50, 60 years post-independence, there has been a 50% decrease in mortality due to malnutrition and infection. And this is not just unique to India, that's been happening all over the world. As a consequence of that, the average life expectancy has gone up quite a bit. And as a consequence of you know, life expectancy going up and a lot of people joining workforce and working for longer years, there's been a little bit influx of money. And uh, as a consequence of that, the affluence and what people eat also has changed. And then what we're dealing with uh, as a bigger consequence of all of that is that 50% of the non-communicable diseases, 50% of the non-communicable diseases are now due to heart disease and cardiovascular disease. And that is true both in urban and rural areas, right? And 25% of all deaths, one in four deaths in India are now due to cardiovascular disease, which in majority of individuals is preventable. So the global population for every 100,000, which is one lakh, uh, for every 100,000 deaths in India, in the world is 235 are due to cardiovascular disease. In India, it's 272, right? And within the, within the realm of cardiovascular disease, ischemic heart disease, which is basically you know, blockages in your heart and stroke contribute 83% of all of cardiovascular disease in India. And there has been a 59% of increase, 59%, almost 60% increase in the number of lives lost due to cardiovascular disease between 1999 and 2010. 
it's a very short period of time that the disease has taken like skyrocketing. And, uh, and there's been a 14 fold increase in urban areas. And all the, if you really look at it, if although the absolute numbers are, are a little different, but it's shocking to find out there is a seven fold increase in rural areas. And between 2005 and 2015, there's been a 70% increase of cardiovascular risk factors and the disease burden. And the number one is hypertension. High blood pressure contributes to, it's gone up. The prevalence of hypertension in India has gone up by 138% between 1990 and 2013. This is a unique exception because the rest of the planet, every country on the planet, high blood pressure numbers are actually going down. India is an exception to it. And because of all of this, the cost of this, the cost of cardiovascular disease burden was expected between 2005 and 2015 to be 250 billion US dollars. Now it's actually expected to be over $3 trillion. So the question is why? Why India does have so much burden? Number one, believe it or not, 30, if you take the entire population across the country. So those of us who live in the you know, major cities like Hyderabad and Bangalore or Delhi may not be seeing actually what's happening in rural areas, unless you are from a rural village and you move to the, one of the major cities, you, you have a perspective. But 30% of Indians are still smoking. And if you go to some of the states like Mizoram and Eastern, Eastern states, it's up to 67%. And the prevalence and, you know, and the number of people who are picking up smoking for the first time, youth, is actually going up. And close to one in three Indians are diagnosed with high blood pressure. It is expected that by 2025, 213 million people in India will, be, will have diagnosed hypertension. And like I mentioned earlier, India is an exception where the prevalence is, is continuously growing up. And diabetes, again, it is, this is now officially the world's capital. In the past two decades, it had doubled. Okay, diabetes has doubled in the urban areas. How about rural areas? Yes, the rural areas numbers may not be absolutely high, but if you look at as proportion of the population, it quadrupled. There are close to 100 million diabetics, or there will be close to 100 million. That is like the one third of American population are going to be diabetics in India. And 70 to 80 million that we don't know are currently pre-diabetics. And pre-diabetes is not a benign condition. Pre-diabetes is, is, is actually damaging your end organs. And how about cholesterol and lipid parameters? Only 20% of India has a normal lipid parameters. 80% of Indians have abnormal lipid parameters. The most common one being hypertriglyceridemia. And, and it has, the, 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 the significance of this is, is crazy because it's gradually increasing the prevalence. If you really look from 1980 to all the way to 2000, that's what you know, I was able to pull up the data from. And the numbers of LDL prevalence across the, country, across the population that is more than 100 and triglycerides more than 150 is rapidly growing up. And awareness is less than 18%, even in ur rural or urban areas. Right, you know, villages. We, you know, we cannot, you know, say that maybe there's the healthcare system is not robust, and so they don't have access to it. But it turns out that only 18, less than 18 percent of the people who live in the cities are actually aware that their cholesterol numbers are bad, and only less than eight percent are actually being treated, and less than five percent are actually under control. So when we say that you know this this you know this there's this mysterious heart attacks happening in India, it turns out that if you really take a deep breath and sit down and ask these detailed questions, it turns out that majority of the Indian population actually fits well into known risk factors. You know, there's been a lot of coverage about what happened to Ganguly recently, but we don't we don't know the details of his health. You know, I was saying to my so some of my friends that if I was if I were Saro Ganguly, and if I had a heart attack needing a stent at 48, as a service to my country and my society, I would have made every single one of my medical records and every single one of my heart scans be made public. And to, hey guys, this is who I am. This is actually what happened to me. So that way you're, you're actually doing a community service, but I don't think that was done. Uh, in terms of obesity, 
right? And it's rapidly, rapidly increasing. And uh, in India, one of the things that we, we actually can, you know, there's a name called a TOFI, T-O-F-I, which is very common in Indian society, which is thin on the outside, but fat on the inside, T-O-F-I. So BMI may not be a best metric for the Indian society, but a better one is to take a tape measure and measure around your belly, right around the belly button level, at the umbilicus level. So that measurement, either in centimeters or inches, should not exceed half of your height. So I wanna repeat that, the measurement around your belly button of your waist should not exceed more than half of your height. If that happens, it doesn't really matter how many push-ups you can do and how much you can bench press. That tells me that you have truncal obesity. And the truncal obesity is an independent risk factor for multiple, multiple medical conditions. And in, in what's happening in you know, childhood obesity that we have about 52 studies, 52 studies as of 2010, showing that close to 20% of Indian children are actually obese now was never the case when I was a kid, when most of you were children, when most of us kids in India, we did not see this many obese children as our friends or in our villages. So this is a new trend that is rapidly, rapidly, you know, uh, encroaching onto Indian society. And this has happened over a very short period of time. And it is expected that by next year, 50% of Indian women would be obese, which is just about as bad as it is here in the US, 50%. That is the expectation. And when it comes to physical activity, it turns out that 50% of the Indian population is physically inactive. Half of the population is absolutely doing no routine physical activity. Less than 10% of the population has a structured routine activity discipline, less than 10%. And when it comes to diet, because this is a, also a risk factor, fat intake has gone up significantly. And a majority of our fat intake are these ultra refined oils. Right, we soak our food in oils. It's, like, it's almost like it's food is floating. You have to look for food somewhere in the middle of a puddle of oil. Right, a lot of people still cook like that. And then on top of that, what we cook in that oil are ultra refined carbohydrates. And as and and on top of that, this meat intake. Right, it's it was never like that. You know, again, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, I'm 50 years old. We'll be 51 in May. But when I was a kid growing up in India. We eat small, you know, one half of a chicken between family of four, maybe once or twice a month. Uh, that's about it. But now if people are eating chicken biryani almost, you know, so frequently that it's, it's shocking. Chicken biryani is soaked in oil. You can literally take a fistful of it and squeeze the oil out of it. And an additional burden is that is this, is the amount rapid growth in fast food and sugary drinks. It's a 14,000 crore business in India one of the most rapidly growing on the planet. On top of that, you know, what could go wrong? You know, you're, you're gorging yourself on, uh, on an ultra refined processed carbohydrate and a processed meat and, and, and washing it down with uh, um, carbonated beverages with sugar. So it turns out that this is a very interesting study. I really like this data is that a couple of researchers in India went around and asked uh, their families and children to see how frequently are our kids consuming this more than four times per week. It turns out 51% of Indian children who are surveyed are consuming more than four times a week of fruit juices. 21% are consuming carbonated beverages and 18% are sweetened, sugar sweetened beverages and 20% of kids are indulging in more than four servings a week of ice cream. And no wonder childhood obesity is in India now is almost 20%, right? So how does that burden compare to United States, right? You know, Dr. Prabhakar and some of you may know him is a, is a pretty well-established and a highly respected cardiologist at the uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And uh, so when you compare, it's, it's, it's actually worse compared to the United States statistics and, and the global population, the cardiovascular disease burden in India looks worse. So how can we fix this, right? What do we have at our disposal? So we have these six pillars that are time-tested, uh, fairly well evidence-based. And what I would like to do is to take you through the journey of this. Why do I so strongly believe that 
lifestyle medicine, simple six pillars of lifestyle medicine will fix majority of this burden. So let's take a look at this. Each one of them, smoking, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia or high cholesterol levels, and the combination of the first three, just see what happens to the risk when you add the first three. And then any of the first four, every single one of these factors that contribute to cardiovascular Every single one of them is a lifestyle parameter. On top of that, a component that we don't talk much about, or we rarely talk about, is this burden imposed by the psychological factors, the social factors, the emotional factors have a huge bearing on cardiovascular disease. So every single one of them is directly or indirectly connected to one of those six pillars. Hence, my strong belief that this disease, the leading cause of death across the human race is preventable, treatable, and potentially even reversible, quote unquote, in majority of patients. So why do why? Why do I so strongly believe it? Why is, what is my why? You know, in the few slides ago, I asked, why do you wanna be healthy? So if you ask me why I do this, why do I focus so much on prevention as an interventional cardiologist is because I borrow inspiration from a man who invented or pioneered um, cardiac transplantation. Christian Barnard famously said that I've saved the lives of 150 people, 150 people uh, by doing heart transplants. If I had focused on preventive medicine earlier, I would have saved 150 million, right? So again, goes back to the same question. Why do you want to be healthy? So to be able, so you gave me an answer. You all gave me an answer and I gave myself an answer when we asked this question, not as some fancy physicians, but as just fellow human beings, we come up with an answer. The fundamental concept in lifestyle medicine is the concept of mindfulness. And mindful about what, you may ask me, is the mindfulness about the answers that came about. Meaning that if you ask me, hey, why do you want to be healthy? I'm, I'm going to say, I, I want to be a part of my family. I want to be healthy. I want to have fun with them. I want to travel with them. I want to you know, share every aspect of life with them. But am I being mindful towards that answer? So that's what I mean by mindfulness. Is that, are we being mindful about this? Is that, you know, why, why indulge in so many unhealthy habits and, and be dependent on, uh, uh, on pharmaceuticals and procedures like the ones that I do, and then why, I wonder, hey, why is my health suffering? So that's what I mean by mindfulness, not necessarily you know, finding yourself a, a rosary and come back with a halo behind your head. That's not the kind of mindfulness I'm talking about. The kind of mindfulness I'm talking about is the one that forces us, that the one that inspires us to be true to our answers and, and live the life you know, the best possible way we want to. And to, to bring about the change, yeah, you, you have to actively think through it. And change could be hard because if I'm going to ask, if any one of us is going to ask a family member, a patient, or a friend to change and undo a lifetime worth of habits, it's going to be difficult. But the way to look at it is baby steps, right? And, and, and every, tiny, tiny little steps, one one hundredth of a change. That this has been proven beyond doubt in, in, you know, in, in behavioral science, that if you bring about one one hundred, that's all, tiny little change every single day, you will gain enormously. The concept is called the power of small gains. Another way of showing this is that if I ask you to climb to the clouds and to, to reach the pinnacle of your life, and I give you two ladders, one ladder with tiny little small steps, another ladder with steps that you can't even reach, which one will get you there to the top first? It's the one which enables you to take baby steps. So that's, that's, so that's where most people fail is that they try to take these huge leaps of faith and then you know, they do have some success and then they realize that, oh wow, this is unattainable and they fall back. So baby steps. And uh, these two quotes, I really like them that the master has failed more times than the beginner has even tried. And also in terms of habits, if we are what we repeatedly do, excellence then is a habit, not a gift. So 
for those of you who are not practicing this, but you want to bring about a change, the fundamental concept is adapt a beginner's mind. Assume that you, we don't know any much about this, the concepts of pillars of lifestyle medicine and be non-judgmental, be non-judgmental about what you're doing and what others are doing and be very patient, be accepting of failures and make it a non-striving approach because this is not a competition because this, you just want to find out what, you know, what can bring out the healthiest you out of yourself and trust yourself while you're doing this and trust some, some advice from professionals like Dr. Sachin and, and let go of failures. And that, that's what mindfulness is about. You have to actively think about this. And to do all of this, what tools do we have? Again, I go back to the same concept. To do all of this, we have simple six tools, except for having to pay a little bit to buy our own food. If you kind of take a closer look, everything else is free. Everything else is free, right? Is there a science? So this is what Dr. Uh, Regina was alluding to earlier, is that is there scientific evidence to support all of this, right? Yes. So we're going to take one pillar at a time, social relationships, right? It turns out a, a meta-analysis of 148 studies clearly showed that the number one thing that allows you, if all of us, let's say we all want to live to be 100, what is the first thing that we want to do is to be a part of a close knit community that does a lot of miracles. And, and there's actually very impressive data. And unfortunately, social isolation, much like in the West, is now rapidly growing in India, especially with the elderly. In the US, it's really bad, right? In the US, it's really bad and it's really rapidly increasing in terms of social isolation. And right, so that's number one is social support. We need social support. Extremely, I cannot emphasize more. That's why I always, you know, when I talk about lifestyle, pillars of lifestyle medicine, I always open with social relationships. The next one is tobacco. So at least in America, we, this used to be a society where cardiologists promoted tobacco. And the industry sold tobacco for pregnant women for a healthy child. Not too long ago, there are still men and women alive who lived through this. So this is not some ancient 15th century. So if you're interested, there's a, there's a fascinating book called The Cigarette, A Political History, you can look into it. Um, but do I need to talk about smoking cessation in 2021? And the answer is absolutely true. Just to give you an example, five years before I came to America, America was debating whether we should ban smoking on a commercial airline or not just five years before I came to the US in, 1990, in 1990. So, and smoking, you know, doesn't really spare any part of the body. And so, and how does it look in India? We talked about it, close to 30% of the population is smoking, but majority of the use of tobacco in India is non-smoke tobacco, right? It's the use of tobacco, not necessarily smoking, it's the use of tobacco in non-smoking forms, right? And, then, and that unfortunately is growing. It's almost like a fashion these days. And the thing with alcohol is that this concept called, you know, drink responsibly and drink moderately. I never really understood what drinking moderately meant because India as a per capita consumer of single malt whiskey is now officially in the top three countries on the planet. And, and when we say to people that drink one drink for women and drink two for men, it's, it's, you know, I, I really just never understood this recommendation because in one hand, every single organization, every single cancer prevention organization on the planet have come together and said, alcohol is a group one carcinogen. Alcohol is listed as among the, one of the most carcinogenic things that we have a choice, right? There are some carcinogens that we get exposed to that we have no choice, like exposure to sunlight, but why would we expose ourselves to one to two drinks of a group one carcinogen? So my plea is that if you drink, please do yourself a favor. Don't drink saying that it is good for you, right? It's listed as a group one carcinogen. So the next burden is emotional stress. So like this famous saying goes that a diamond is a piece of coal. It's nothing but a piece of coal that handles stress exceptionally well. 
So that's what you know stress is about. I, I agree that it's easier said than done, but most of the stress is what we feel and how we react to it than the stress itself. And the emotional stress, a couple of my classmates are pretty you know well established and popular psych psychiatrists in India, and you know I hear them talk about this all the time. The emotional stress burden in India is growing a rapid, extremely rapidly. And, and the stress is an acute stress and a chronic stress, both An effect on insulin resistance, right? And on top of that, you know, you apply, you combine this with obesity, smoking, low physical activity, they all kind of go hand in hand with depression. And people don't talk about this much. There's, in, in, you know, probably, you know, probably Indian society still has a lot of taboo uh, not to talk about this openly, but this is a huge burden in India. And on top of that, socioeconomic stress, people, societies that live, you know, poverty, joblessness, job-related stress, all of this actually have biological pathways that directly affect cardiovascular disease. So mind, you know, as the Sanskrit saying goes, yad bhavam tad bhavati, right? Your, your, your existence is a manifestation of your thought or the same person also said bhavanatma karam jagat, meaning that again, the world is a manifestation of your thought. And um, in terms of physical activity, so this dude is, you know, spending a little bit more time because on the treadmill because his doctor said so. So it turns out that India is now ranked officially as the eighth worst on the planet when it comes to societal physical activity. So what we recommend, in, at least for the U.S. guidelines, which should be applicable to pretty much all of human race, is that at least 30 minutes, at least 30 minutes of moderate intense activity right, five to seven days a week, or 25 minutes of vigorous activity, or high intensity activity. So, but, but in a simple practical point of view, do something that you enjoy, and do it consistently for almost on all days of the week, if possible, and, and enjoy doing it. And turns out that majority of the benefit, right, it's not about trying to be a marathon runner, majority of this benefit actually comes within the first 15 to 20 minutes of doing it. The key is to being able to do it consistently of some type of physical activity of your choosing and you enjoy doing it. No point in going to the gym and being yelled at by your instructor while you hate being at the gym. Instead, you want to be playing racquetball. So that's what you should be doing. So pick up something that you actually enjoy doing it, do it consistently. And behind their cooking is a culture, a family heritage, a personal choice. So everybody is quote unquote an expert, right? So that's what has done to nutrition is why there is so much confusion and so much, nobody, there's no confusion about smoking cessation. There's no confusion about sleep. There's none of that. The entire confusion in lifestyle medicine is about only one pillar of nutrition because it is such a deeply personal thing. So, you know, and then that leads to diet, diet wars. And then, you know, to, I said this once, you know, a couple of years ago, and it, it became kind of popular, is that while the ketos and the phytos are fighting the battle, the Cheetos are winning the war, right? And uh, is that it's, 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 it's the junk food. The, the number one is the number one, you know, the number one paradigm or number one principle is to, is to minimize or eliminate all processed food. That's rule number one. So before we go there, stop looking at food as carbs, protein, and fat, right? You don't go to Sabji Mandi or, 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 or some grocery store in India and look for, hey, today I'm gonna buy six carbohydrates, seven proteins, and eight fats. 
right? But you don't tell your mom when you're cooking, hey, mom, cook me some nice fat for dinner tonight, right? We, nobody talks about food like that. But when, it, when, we, when we open a scientific discussion, all of a sudden, we talk about food in, in, in molecules, right? So that, and the reason is because some of it is industry that, 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 that you know, invaded science and public opinion and, you know, left a big confusion and which still continues. So and this is a beautiful paper from the National Institute of Health last year or 2019, I should say, uh, published, uh, yeah, I believe in the Lancet uh, about the, the, what happens with processed foods. Right, processed foods is 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 like, and people ask me, you know, I joke about this. You know, people ask me, what is a processed food? I, I you know what I joke about this. Processed food is like pornography. You know it when you see it. There's no definition for it. Well, there is definition for it, but from a simplistic point of view, right? And and in terms of how food affects each component of of cardiovascular health, right? And we know this from the Dash trial that a diet that is predominantly plant based drops the blood pressure like, like, a, like a brick. So much so that to approve a drug, to approve a drug, the United States for blood pressure, the United States FDA requires only a drop in three millimeters of blood pressure. But on a completely plant-based diet or a DASH diet with salt restriction, the blood pressure drops by up to 20 millimeters. Just think about that. Right? And that's one of the reasons why DASH diet made it to a class one indication with level of evidence A. There are very few things in cardiovascular medicine that do this. And predominantly plant-based DASH diet is one of them. And if most people eat like that, I will not be prescribing blood pressure medications. Same thing with cholesterol, right? There's a beautiful paper that clearly shows that vegetarian and a plant-based diets can be and should be used as an alternative, especially when the intent of treatment is primary prevention, right? And, and, and say multiple studies, you know, this is a portfolio study that clearly showed that people who eat predominantly or exclusively a plant-based diet drop their cholesterol numbers, all the components of cholesterol numbers significantly, right? And that's so much so that it made it to the guidelines. The number one parameter that we should be talking to our patients, friends, and family when it comes to lipid lowering is healthy lifestyle. Everything else comes next. That should be the first foundation, right? Same thing with diabetes. We have multiple sets of databases, extremely well done, ran large randomized controlled trials that clearly showed that lifestyle-based strategies are extremely useful in prevention, treating, and potentially putting diabetes, type two diabetes into remission. And the 2019 American Diabetes Association guidelines support various kinds of diets. But if you look at them, majority of them are predominantly plant, whole food, plant-based diets. The American Association of Clinical Endocrinology, on the other hand, is telling us that lifestyle therapies begin with nutrition to prevent, to treat, and potentially put type two diabetes into remission. And they are going completely out and saying all patients should primarily be on a plant-based diet. And, and, and if, if you want to read a book, you know, the number one secret diabetes is, you know, no matter what you eat as healthy as food, it has to somehow or the other, it has to boil down to at the end of the day, eating less calories. And I strongly support and suggest this book. If you, if you are a diabetic, if your family member is a diabetic, is to read this book by Roy Taylor. And I uh, had some, done some phenomenal basic research and clinical research on this and wrote a book for lay people, non-medical people. I strongly urge you to read that book. And if you do all of this, if you do all of this, what do the prevention guidelines tell, at least in the US, which are pretty much applicable to anywhere in the world because, you know, yes, we are different, but not that different, right? And that when it comes to the diet part, the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association diet recommendation, except for maybe small portions of fish, is in full support of a fully plant-based diet, right? And that dietary pattern, again, gets a class one indication, right? So when you think of a plant-based diet, we want to we wanna make sure that you, are, you get the message right, right? So French fries are also plant-based. Oreo cookies are French fries. All the sodas that we drink are also plant-based. That doesn't mean that they're health promoting, 
So there's actually beautiful clinical outcomes data showing that the types of plant-based food have health outcomes. So just because something is plant-based, please don't eat junk food. And this is extremely applicable to the Indian society, right? We are quote unquote vegetarians, but if you really stop and think about it for a second, our vegetarianism is pseudo vegetarianism. Our food is overcooked. Our food is loaded with butter and oil. Our food is loaded with salt and sugar. Yes, it is vegetarian, but it is not health promoting. And when I ask people to eat predominantly a plant-based diet, people perceive that we eat like this. This is what this is all we have to eat. But turns out that eating, taking these simple ingredients, fruits, vegetables, lentils, and beans, which we have no shortage of in India, right? There are hundreds of different types of lentils, beans, and whole grains in India. Just a matter of how to cook like our ancestors used to cook, right? So we can make meals that look like this that are nutrient. So the, in a nutshell, don't eat crap, calorie rich and processed food and eat food, not too much, mostly or exclusively plants. And here is a plate put forth by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. This is what our plates should look like. Half of our plate should be filled with fruits and vegetables. The rest with lentils, beans, nuts, and some very, very small quantities of unpro very small quantities of processed grains, if you want to do it, they are, you know, just whole grains. The next pillar that we don't talk much about is sleep. Gandhi said this famously, that each night when I go to sleep, I die. And the next morning I wake up to be reborn, right? And uh, sleep, extremely important, eight, seven to eight hours. Seven to eight hours is this window for every single health related parameter, head to toe. Now there is there's a lot of new data coming out that sleep may be directly related to dementia. And uh, now it's just not about the duration of sleep, the quality of sleep and how many times you actually wake up. So make sleep a priority. And we can do an entire discussion on sleep. I, I think my wife already did that. Um, so sleep duration and diabetes. Right, if those who, if you're diabetics and you'll know this, the night, the morning, the nights when you don't sleep well, the next morning you will see a spike in your glucose. Extreme and sleep is now is being considered. People who do night shift work for years and years, it is considered as a probable carcinogen. There may be some link to lack of sleep causing some some through some mechanism. We don't know that. So the, my plea is, don't let your sleep become a dream. And after all of this, after all of this science-based messaging, what we will hear from our patients, friends, and family, doc, this disease runs in my family. So here is a story. That's why I put this in court. These were the words by somebody. I'll tell you who that person is. That there are no old men in my family. Everybody's, all branches of my family tree have been cut short by cardiovascular disease. I believe the people in this room have the power and even a duty to change that. These were the words by a 47 year old cardiologist who just happens to be the president of American Heart Association in 2017, who a day before had a massive heart attack while attending the American Heart Association meeting. That's what he said is that because he had a heart attack and a lot of this disease is genetic and it's in his family. But it turns out that we have data from four large clinical research uh, databases that clearly show that by living a healthy lifestyle, by not smoking, keeping a BMI below 30, and being physically active, and eat at least halfway decent, if you did that, you can lower the risk of a cardiovascular event by almost 50%, even in the setting of a high genetic risk. I just want to repeat this one more time. Even in the setting of a high genetic risk, if you live a healthy lifestyle, you can lower the risk of actually having a cardiovascular event by close to 50%. So healthy and based on papers like this, I, you know, there, and there's another paper titled, Healthy Living is the Best Revenge. Why do we say that? 
that by, by using those healthy living parameters, you can lower the risk of any chronic disease by 78%, diabetes by 93%, heart attack by 81%, stroke by 50%, and all cancers by 36%. Nothing I know in medicine is this powerful, right? So this is something extreme. This is an issue that, that can no longer wait. Health promotion and disease prevention. This, this should be the primary modality of everything that we did. So that's my message. And you know we need to flip this pyramid, this pyramid of tertiary care to health promotion. Majority of the world's health care is based on hospital-based medicine. If we really care for health care, we should prioritize health of the society, not the disease management of the society. So, so I'll stop here and this is a nonprofit I run. Uh, look us up on Facebook and look us up on, on, on social media and we have a website. This is my wife and I, we founded this a couple of years ago to take this message selflessly to as many communities as possible locally here in where we live across the country in the US. But now we, you know, we are reaching India and other places. Um, so if I can be of any help and assistance, those are my emails. Uh, I'm on Twitter as Kaushik Reddy MD. Uh, that's, uh, so you can reach me through these you know, social media or, or my emails. So I will stop here again. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to do it. Um, again, I apologize if I went a little longer than the allotted time. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Kaushik. It was uh, kind of, a, it was inspiring for most of the people actually. Unfortunately, you know, we did a little bit uh, extra caution regard, uh, related to the safe security aspect. Many people couldn't join. So we kind of shared the Facebook actually, because last time one of our webinar was hacked by some miscreants. So this time we kind of uh, tightened the security. Dr. Richala, you must be knowing, she's also part of the group. So we yeah. kind of, her husband, the Vivek sir also helped us to tighten the security, but all will be shared in all the groups and Facebooks actually. We had at that time 48 participants. Normally we have hundred plus, but a lot of people have called up and told that, you know, they were not able to join. Anyway, the questions can start actually. Um, I think there are some questions coming in. This is from Dr. Rekha Tyagarajan. Can we eat fruits along with food? This is a question. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's really, you know, it's, I, I tell people to start every meal with the fruit. So that way you're, you're actually eating the, the health, the health promoting, you're filling up your belly with the health promoting item first. <laughs> right. Again, you know, fruit is, and again, this distinction between should I eat fruit before these are, you know, these, these are questions and concerns of luxury. Most people are eating junk food and, 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 you know, uh, hurting themselves by living it, uh, for lack of better words, by really bad lifestyle choices. So yeah, I, I actually try to incorporate a fruit into every single meal because the current recommendations is eat at least three to five servings of fruits a day. So yeah, I, I have no problems. I know I've been eating fruits pretty much, you know, for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and sometimes for snacks every single day, and I have no problems with it. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Doc, I have a question. Actually, I have seen something about stress, you know, which in which you have shown a uh, uh, India map. In this, I, I have seen that uh, South Indian part is kind of uh, less, you know, it is in blue, but uh, the top, the Arunachal Pradesh region and other regions are red. Uh, is there any significance with the, you know, the political scenario or what? Or the yeah, thing? absolutely. There, there, there are a lot of social political aspects go into this. You know, you know, if you really go to the farming belts in India, where majority of the population is still living in rural areas and doing farming, and the, you know, I, you don't need me to tell uh, the, you know, the people in India as to how stressed our farmers are, and as a consequence of that, you know, uh, acute MI rates, not to mention the suicide rates. Uh, have gone up, have skyrocketed in the past five to 10 years. So it turns out that acute stress, acute stress uh, and life lived with a sense of hostility and anger is it just about the same risk of plaque rupture and heart attack as that of people smoking. I know. And that data, yeah, that data actually, there are a couple of beautiful German papers from Germany 
that show that is um, people who live uh, life with anger, social hostility, and, and a lot of frustration that leads to emotional stress on a daily basis. Uh, the risk of having a heart attack is just about act, active smoking. Okay, one more question. So many uh, kind of uh, compliments are uh, flowing, you know, definitely your presentations are always very beautiful and en encouraging. There is one more question, Doc. Um, you know, this is about from Sony Praveen, one of our clients from Indonesia. What about dairy products? Yogurt considered to be safe. Is it considered to be safe? So Major the way to, this needs to be addressed uh, so, at a larger scale in India. Yeah. So the way to look at dairy in India or anywhere else, and, you know, a lot of people, you know, uh, some of my answers may be, may be controversial, but I'm, I'm going to just speak my mind. So, so hear me out. So uh, there's no need for humans to be drinking, you know, the milk of another animal. There's absolutely really no need. If you want to drink it, you, uh, you know, we, none of us is going to stop you from doing it. But there is no need, there's really no need for us to be doing it, especially when we come from a culture where we are in one breath to say cow is mother, you know, culturally we do that in India. Uh, and then if we call cow a mother, why are we keeping our mothers in captivity, millions of them in captivity and artificially keeping them pregnant so we could drink their milk? So if you want to drink milk, drink it as a choice, but there's no nutritional need to us to drink milk of another animal for the rest of our lives. Exactly. And, and there's no, yeah, if, if that's the only, so if you're, in a, for example, you know, a lot of times when you, you know, I grew up in a small farming village and we used to have our own dairy farm, but at the same time, you know, we, our schools also used to make milk, <laughs> uh, powdered milk and feed it to us as when we went as a, as a part of our lunch program. So if you put all of the data together, it turns out that you know, countries like India and some other poorer countries or poorer societies, uh, both in Africa and Asia, is for children, milk is unfortunately the only form of calories that they're getting. So if milk day-to-day -day, day -to -day serving of two to three cups of milk is the only source of protein or the only source of calcium that you're getting, then I, I, I'm not gonna fight you about that. But if you have access to everything else, uh, there's no need for us to be drinking milk. There's absolutely no need. Yeah, one another yeah. important question, Christiel, I, I will uh, you know, I take out your question a little later, but this is very important. Dr. Prashant Shankar, he's also an ISLM member and uh, he's a diabetologist. He follows a, a predominantly plant-based and he has reduced weight and he's reversed his condition and things like that. So his question is basically Kerala type of a population where predominantly non-vegetarian population, um, you know, we cannot take out fish and meat completely because, you know, it's like a sudden change, you know, they'll not get many of the things. We also face the same kind of uh, experiences the same because, you know, we ask them to go for uh, legumes more often, you know, they have gastric irritations, it's not available, many of those kind of things. So, so what is the way to kind of bring them into a healthier, uh, much healthier so way? So the, the best way to do it is to take the issue head on because look, you know, just go to, you know, you know, again, you know, if, if the doctor is practicing in Kerala, you know, you know, he doesn't need me to be, because I never practice medicine in India. All of my knowledge is just by reading as to what's going on. But Kerala is also India's capital of heart disease. Exactly. Yeah. You know, in one breath, we say that, you know, Keralites are vegetarian, but we in, in Kerala, you know, we use saturated fat starting with breakfast because everything is cooked with coconut oil <laughs> right so we, we and and then on top of that you add saturated fat through 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 meat and you 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 have to address that you know unless you address that head on there's no way around it because the concept of saturated fat in your diet causing heart disease is is it's, it's not, it's beyond reason. It's just proven beyond doubt. Yeah, that's, that's so, what we okay. normally do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and on top of that, on top of that, you know, I, I don't know if it does, but you know, the few of the older editions of Harrison, you know, when I was a medical student as an entity called Kerala pancreatitis, right? There's a medical entity called Kerala pancreatitis. The, the, the prevalence of pancreatitis in Kerala because of the amount of fat in our food that leads to hypertriglyceridemia. And on also on top of that, you know, vegetarianism in Kerala, vegetarianism in India in general, 
is yes, you know, you could be eating, you know, dosa and vada fried in oil, right? Yeah. And it's floating in, you know, all kinds of unhealthy, it's technically it's vegetarian, but is that promoting your health? That's the question. So, and you know, this notion about whole grains not being available, that is not true. Our ancestors, you know, two generations ago, or you know, maybe, maybe the, before the British came to India, very few people, only the richest of the rich people had access to white polished rice. Before that, you know, entire Indian farming, close to 70% of India's agricultural land before the British came to India was not growing rice. It was growing ragi, you know, and many other things. And uh, all kinds of, you know, johar and many other whole grains. That's what people ate. Yeah. One, uh, another question, you know, definitely, you know, this is something uh, to be addressed on a, you know, day-to-day -day level and, you know, as medical fraternity coming forward, talking about it more and more often will definitely help. You know, we are, I, as uh, Dr. Prashant and me face uh, problems from the other end, like the Keto and other advocates, you know, this is a little frustrating. We will discuss it another uh, meeting in, in the doctor's only group. So another one is from Dr. Rekha Tyagarajan. This is about vitamin B12 deficiency and whole food plant-based diet. So how can, um, you know, kind of uh, take a supplement, it. just take, take a supplement, yeah. take a yeah. supplement. Don't risk this. Don't, there's absolutely no ambiguity about it. If you decide to go hundred percent plant-based diet, a whole food plant-based diet, please do not risk this. Start taking a vitamin B12 supplement from day one. Don't even wait for measurements. Just don't even risk it because it's inexpensive. It is dirt cheap. You can get like entire years worth of supply for, you know, $25, $30 dollars in the US. And, uh, and it's, it's 2,500 micrograms uh, a week. Uh, so yeah, my, my suggestion is that is, that, is, that is not negotiable. If you decide to go on a 100% plant-based diet, take a B12 supplement. Don't, don't, this is not even up for discussion. Yes. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that's, that's the answer she's looking for, but uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, there are a lot of uh, discussions regarding this, you know, Rekha, we can have another discussion with Dr. Reddy uh, regarding this, you know, like I, I, me and my daughter, both of us have taken B12 deficiency over the last one and a half years. Um, you know, I don't want to take chances. I mean, these uh, guidance are also given by Dr. Reddy and others in the group, you know, ISLM group itself. One more. No, no, this, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Uh, whether, okay, this is from Fahim. Um, you know, Fahim is the technical uh, head of uh, Investor on Health now. Uh, you know, he is also changing to a plant-based diet over the last one week or so, you know, like, but he's having difficulty with a little, you know, like initial phase of difficulty is there. So he's asking uh, whether too many fruits increases triglycerides uh, level. I'm not aware of that. No, if it, too, so the things that increase triglycerides are refined carbohydrates, excess calories at the end of the day, right? Fruits are bound with fiber, right? Uh, if uh, fruits are bound with fiber, you know, again, but it also depends on where your baseline health status is. If you're a diabetic on insulin, right? Yes, eating a grape is going to increase your triglycerides. Eating a eating grapes is going to increase your you know insulin levels. Eating grapes is going to jack up your sugar like crazy. So if you are a diabetic uh, with overweight and needing insulin or not needing insulin, the way to transition to a plant based food is that not to eat even foods that are high glycemic. Uh, you know, in the first way of you know if you are a diabetic on insulin and you want to transition to a plant-based food, potato is not your first go-to food, right? So you need to eat, you know, lettuce, you know, oh, green, leafy, green leafy vegetables and, you know, non-rice non grains. That's what you should start with. And then as you lose weight, yeah, right? And you lose your, you know, visceral, you know, visceral adiposity, then your body can tolerate some of the high glycemic foods. But if you start just because somebody said go on a plant-based diet and you start eating potatoes and grapes and you wonder why my triglycerides are going up because you just started it the kind of a wrong about way. So that's why, you know, if you're a diabetic on insulin and you want to go on a plant-based diet, you should do that in consultation with the physician who knows what he or she is doing. Yeah. Two more questions, doc. Uh, uh, rest of the questions, we will again bring Dr. Reddy in. 
you know, he's the kind of uh, authority in uh, this segment. So, uh, you know, one is, uh, you know, this is a kind of a controversy which goes on, which we keep discussing in our group. Basically, coconut oil is promoted by even our doctors, like uh, Dr. B.M. Hegde. He's a very famous cardiologist. Uh, I know, I know, I know Dr. Hegde. I respect him, but I also disagree with him with close to 60% of things he says. <laughs> exactly. So, so w- one of the things that in the community <clears throat> of science, <clears throat> right, the way to think through science is that nobody is an authority in science. The only authority, there's an old saying in science, we trust in God, everybody else must bring data, right? Hegde is not the God of medicine. Nobody is the God of medicine. No, evidence, like, you know, evidence is clear. So much so that every single scientific authority on the planet every single cardiovascular scientific authority and the American Heart Association put out a special 25, 30 page document on the every single data published on coconut oil. It is one of the most concentrated form of saturated fat. Exactly. Yeah, so does that mean that you just can never ever ever touch even a drop of coconut oil? That's not the point because there's no such thing as one food is somehow miraculously gonna cure everything or somehow one food is gonna disastrously destroy your health. That's a very wrong way to look at it. It is a pattern, right? You know, if you eat a little bit of coconut oil on something that you enjoy once in a rare blue moon, nobody's gonna fight you with that because over a course of lifetime, your pattern has been towards a very healthy diet. But on the other hand, if you're starting with, you know, teaspoons full of coconut oil in your coffee for breakfast, and then doing the same thing for lunch and same thing for dinner. And you wonder why you have heart disease because heck they said so already said so, or somebody said so. That's not how science works. Science works with where the contemporary evidence is and where the consensus opinion is. And that's why I tell people is just don't listen to one person. That the only authority in science is evidence, not an individual. One last question. These two questions have come uh, combined. You know, Dr. Pratyusha, you are aware. Um, you know, her uh, doubt is anti-gravity exercises and cardiovascular health. Can you show, show some light, uh, light into, on those things? And also, is hereditary, somebody, Shailaja, is heart disease hereditary? I mean, that's uh, definitely I've answered that question already. The first one, uh, anti-gravity. So, so... Define an anti-gravity exercise for me. What are we talking about? Anti-gravity exercise as in like... Um, yeah, can jumping? you explain that, uh, Dr. Pratisha? Because, you know, uh, you know, there is a lot of fad coming up now, you know, the anti-gravity exercises and, you know, many of these anti-gravity yoga, something like happiness yoga. Every day something or the other comes up, actually. So, you know... Uh, yeah. Look, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. You know, you know, every Friday I teach a class. Every Friday, I teach a class to my patients. Yesterday, uh, we invited a man. He, he was also a U.S. veteran. Believe it or not, he fought in the Battle of the Bulge. 100, you know, he's 100, he turned 100 years last Friday. <laughs> and he's a retired anesthesiologist. And his mind is sharp as a needle. I got and when we asked him, and we invited him to come and speak, give as a motivational speaker for 10 minutes, he stayed through the entire two hour class and listened intently and commented on everything that I was teaching. Excellent. And when we asked him, you know, in terms of, you know, just I mean, giving you a long winded answer about anti-gravity exercise, this man rides his bicycle for 60 miles every week. And he swims for half an hour every single day. And he's hundred years old. So, my, my thing about exercise is that move anything that you can and do not neglect strength training. I cannot emphasize this more. Do not neglect strength training, be it body weight, you know, push ups, pull ups, lunge, squats. That's it, you do it with your own body weight, but do it consistently because as we age, which we are all aging, right? Nobody's reverse aging. Uh, as we age, we lose muscle mass. So, and also as we age, dietary protein becomes an important component. Do not neglect that, right? As you age, especially after age 65, you need a little bit more protein. It doesn't mean that you have to start eating dead animals' flesh, 
You can just eat a little bit more lentils, beans, and legumes, and you'll be fine. And to me, and that's the way I counsel about exercise, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, this is the first time that I'm hearing the concept called anti-gravity exercise. So I don't want to answer just because, you know, I want to answer someone like I know something. I just, I, I just don't even know what an anti-gravity exercise is. Yeah, the only time I would think of an anti-gravity exercise is that if you're training to be an astronaut, but if you're training to be on land, walk with us, just walk with us and lift some weights. True. Doc, can you answer two more questions? Sure. Yes, okay. One is actually the, uh, one of our client again. Is taking psyllium husk daily at night before sleep helpful in controlling diabetes and cholesterol? And also start starting the morning with cumin seed sock overnight. I think he indirectly kind of uh, explained the question. It's more of the pattern, more important, not single uh, food things, but he can yeah, help. Yeah, yeah, please, yeah, don't look at any one food as a superfood. No one food is going to cure any disease. If somebody is telling that to you, just don't listen to them. You have to stick to a pattern. I wish life was that simple. I wish nutrition was that simple that you pick up some super food and it's going to cure or be all and cure. And also, and also, please, please do not conform to this notion and believe that just because you're going 100% plant-based and miraculously every single one of your diseases is going to go away. If somebody is telling you that, they are lying to you. Yeah. Last no. question. And, and yes, yeah, so basically, you know, I, I just want to touch upon what that question is. Is that basically what you are looking for, uh, sir or madam, whoever is asked the question? Is that psyllium husk and those, you know, soaking those uh, seeds? I do all of that. I don't take psyllium husk, but make sure that your diet at the end of the day has a lot of fiber. That's what psyllium husk is. Is at the end of the day, it's fiber. You know, you people ask me, oh, what is the secret ingredient in all these plant-based foods? And I said, it's fiber and water. Those are the two most important secret ingredients in a plant-based food. Nothing, and then it's very small quantities of quote unquote phytonutrients. But the most important ingredients that you get in this, in a predominantly a plant-based diet is fiber and water. Thank you. Yeah. Tony Praveen again. Uh, again, what is the best cooking oil for Indian food? You know, this is like always a doubt for most yeah. people actually. The best in, okay, now you're gonna hear this from a fellow Indian, okay? Hear me out. The best cooking oil for Indian food is water. Learn to cook without oil, just for love of your health. Try it for one week. Just try cooking exactly what you cook. Instead of using oil, do one of two things. Steam the vegetables a little bit before you put it in the pan. Then you'll realize a few things or put some water instead of oil and see what happens. See what happens. One thing I'll guarantee you that you're not going to die of heart attack just because you stopped eating oil. The reason is that you want to be careful the way we cook with them. One tablespoon of oil is 125 calories. Okay. One tablespoon of oil is 125 calories. No food that humans consume on the planet is more calorically dense. Okay, and we are emptying boxes and um, boxes of so, uh, oil in every Indian household on a monthly basis. So there's really nothing, you know, like eat, you know, eat whole foods. Oils are not whole foods, but if it if it adds a little flavor to your food, it adds a little flavor to your salad. Go for it. But if you absolutely have to cook with it, use it very, very, very sparingly. Very sparingly. But I, you know, we completely stop cooking with oil and we cook Indian food majority of the times. And two things will happen when you stop sauteing or cooking Indian food with, without oil, two things will happen. And trust me, three of my Indian nurses that I work with at my hospital, and all three of them are from Kerala. And they heard my lectures, they came to my lectures, you know. What the heck? Let's give it a try. Two of them came off from blood pressure medications. And one of them who is 51 years old told me yesterday that she climbed seven flights to the hospital and she felt, oh, wow, I'm no longer short of breath because she lost enormous amount of the weight. So what will happen is two things will happen once you stop cooking Indian food with oil. One, the spices, right? We are, we are fortunate in India because we have more spices than there are stars in the galaxy. Right? So there's no shortage of that, how to make Indian food flavorful without oil. And two, you will realize that you are actually adding less salt to your food. 
I, the only way to find out is not to listen to me. Just try this at home. Try cooking Indian food without oil, but to 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 kind of cook it. A little bit of water, or you can make your own vegetable broth in India, or steam the vegetables. Steam the vegetables before you put them on the sautéing pan, and you'll be surprised that you know they cook faster, taste better, and healthier without caloric density. Yeah. Uh, one last question from me. Actually, uh, you know, some of the, you know, we, uh, you know, IOH has clients from all across the world, though the numbers are less, you know, like, uh, uh, but, you know, the multicultural kind of people are the ones we're having. We try to kind of, uh, you know, bring them to a whole plant-based kind of an eating pattern, not completely, but, uh, you know, 30% of them go completely into that. You know, there are some percentage of them, maybe 10% or 20% of them coming up with this idea of whole food plant-based, the vegan stuff, you know, but they do not understand the concept of calorie deficit or calorie restriction to lose weight. Or So can you just throw some light on that aspect of it, actually, you know, even though uh, diet is a plant-based, it still can make you put on weight if it is not uh, properly uh, raw. Wheat. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, at the end of the day, you know, calories count at the end of the day, it's just absolutely right. And believe it or not, I have all these, all these methods, you know, keto diet, you know, whatever paleo diet, vegan diet, all these diets at the end of the day, accomplish one thing. If you do it the right way, they, lower your caloric intake. That's the whole idea. If you don't accomplish that, it's not going to work. So, yeah, it's just, you know, it's, it's just, you know, th these are laws of thermodynamics. You can't change them just because you want to fit them into uh, your dietary paradigm. Okay. These are laws of thermodynamics, you just can, it's just like laws of gravity and laws of physics. They are not going to conform to what I believe in or what somebody else will listen. But human energy balance, you know, in terms of calorie intake and calorie output is at the core of its core is, is it follows the laws of thermodynamics and you're, you're, you're not going to change them because, you know, you're a vegan or you're a keto person or whatever it is. So yes, at the end of the day, please be mindful of the caloric intake. Absolutely now, true. Last question. Okay. Uh, this is about intermittent fasting. There are some questions which we received in the group also. Uh, you know, what's the opinion about intermittent fasting? There, there is a client uh, even sent a video of uh, David Sinclair. You know, you were the one who introduced me to David Sinclair and uh, Walter Longo and all actually. So one of the videos actually, you know, in which he was kind of uh, talking big things about intermittent fasting. So can you just throw some light? Yeah, so the thing, again, you know, intermittent fasting, if you look at it carefully, right? Intermittent fasting is also a, a very organized way of calorie restriction. At the end of the day, compared to a month before, once you go on intermittent fasting, the biological mechanism is that you are in 24-hour cycle, you're eating less calories, right? That, that's the only, but think about it. Let's say I do intermittent fasting, but during the periods of feasting, I somehow end up gorging so much that I actually am eating 400 calories more Right, because I have not eaten for the previous 16 hours and I have only eight hour window to eat and I am starving. And I eat two packets of chicken biryani and an ice cream and four jalebis and rasagullas and gulab jamuns. <laughs> Will that work? Well, I'm still intermittent fasting, right? I'm intermittent, well, I'm just, I have an eight, eight hour window but that's what I'm gonna eat during those eight hours. Right, two or three packets of biryani, a whole bucket full of jalebis, rasgullas, and rasmalai and jalebis, and, and gulab jamuns. Will that work? The answer is no. So at the end of the day, no matter how you do it, it it's gonna boil down to calorie restriction and intermittent fasting, if you do it the right way, is a very organized way of doing it. It's a very disciplined, gives you a time frame, and, uh, and it's an organized way, way of doing it, yeah. Excellent. Uh, I think all of uh, you guys have enjoyed the speech. Uh, a lot of doubt that itself shows that, you know, they were eagerly kind of uh, listening to your uh, speech. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Kaushik, for the inspiring talk. I'm sure that a lot of people will change uh, the way. Uh, oh, well, there's one last question. looks like that yes. came up uh, on um, somebody named Srihari asking about, you know, eating coconut as a food. 
But think about it, right? Before this whole thing became a fad, majority of India, maybe Kerala may be an exception, majority of India, when I grew up, the only time that we actually ate a piece of actual coconut is on Saturday mornings when mom said our prayers, right? Oh, and we those, went into the mandir. We went into the mandir. Yeah, we went into the mandir in India. She broke a coconut and she chopped it off into small pieces. She gave me and my brother small pieces. The rest of the coconut, we stood in front of the house and gave it to all the village kids. If you eat coconut that way, it's fine. But the biology of coconut is that it's a concentrated form of saturated fat. Doesn't mean that you can never eat a piece of coconut. Again, goes back to the same, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record because that's what the science shows. It is the pattern and consistency. If you eat large amounts of coconut on a daily basis, three meals a week, three meals a day, what I suggest is do that for a month and go and have your cholesterol levels checked and, and, and see what happens. See what happens because you know individual biology may differ a little bit because you know these determine you know these risk factors are stochastic, they are not deterministic. So yeah, again, yeah, so yeah, patterns, people, patterns, patterns, patterns. But the key here, like you know, I showed in one slide, is eat predominantly a whole food plant-based diet. Whether you do it exclusively or not, has to be a deeply personal choice because you know there are a lot of other things that factor in to, to bringing about this change. So hope that was helpful. And once again, Regina, thanks for the opportunity. And I wish everybody health, stay safe. And, um, and whenever the vaccine is available, please take the vaccine. I got both of my doses and please don't conform into this anti-vaccination campaign that is getting out of control across the world. So whenever COVID vaccine is available in India, please take it because there is no other way out of it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kaushik Reddy, for this inspiring talk. Uh, you know, like uh, I, I see, actually, I, I'm sure that there will be more more questions. Which uh, you know, another session we can, you know, whenever you're free, we can plan it. You know, uh, you know, for a more, you know, another doctors crowd and for the, another public general public. Actually, this time we mixed it uh, together, and uh, I. Yeah. Uh, and I also express my gratitude for all these people who attended the program, those uh, who couldn't because of the signing in issue. Uh, we will be sharing the recorded version that was done because you know that last time we had issues with, uh, you know, this miscreants creating issues. So Dr. Richalal's um, husband, who is, uh, you know, professor at IIT, and he has uh, helped a lot to put in security systems in place so that we will not have further issues actually. So, I'm sure, but this uh, recorded session will be going on all social media platforms and all our WhatsApp groups. Each of the WhatsApp group have around uh, 70, 80 people. So I know they will keep sharing their families and all actually. So this will reach out to a lot of people actually. Uh, as uh, Dr. Reddy said, let's make incremental changes, you know, slowly start making the changes. That's the way we, I mean, for us also, I think we took almost 10 years to get to this level actually. Initially we started off uh, eating salads and then slowly, slowly started, you know, cutting down animal products. Actually, I'm uh, like one and a half years, uh, you know, I'm completely off animal products. I don't feel that, uh, you know, coming from a Kerala Muslim family, I don't feel that I'm deprived of anything. Rather, I enjoy the eating. I feel that my skin and my overall uh, day morning feeling, you know, the positive feeling, everything goes high with the uh, uh, whole food plant-based eating pattern. And thank you so much for once again to all of you. We will be sharing the recorded session to all. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Bye. I know.